thank you all for coming tonight. I'm super excited to teach you some of the things I've learned so far in the blockchain space. Uh, I'm Nisa Andrews. I'm a DApps designer and a product designer at Uber. At Uber, I help drivers uh, from all around the world, including developing countries that don't have cars, get a car and start earning money on the Uber platform. Prior to Uber, I was freelancing at Toptal and freelancing independently in the blockchain space. I have a few projects I worked on, which Andy mentioned, are ICO Stats, uh, Path Forward, and WeTrust, which we'll be covering tonight. And before that, I was UX designer at Razorfish. So just a disclaimer, I am invested in WeTrust and Ethereum, and the information I provide tonight is for educational purposes only and does not serve as financial legal advice. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so what we're going to cover this, this is what we're going to cover this evening. I will keep things pretty high level and simple and won't get too technical. Um, so we'll talk about the use case of Ethereum, uh, what Ethereum is, what Ethereum dApps are, and how to design for them. Uh, so first, our use case for Ethereum. Uh, before we get into talking about dApps, I'd like to introduce you to somebody. This is Catherine. She is a 39-year-old immigrant from Mexico. Where'd she go? Okay. Uh, five years ago, Catherine moved from Mexico to LA. She works as a receptionist at a dental office and is attending school for dentistry. Uh, she wants to build up a nest egg in case of an emergency because she doesn't have access to credit and her current job doesn't pay well. So typically, uh, when Catherine needs money for an emergency, she uses payday loans. Uh, and so when she does this, she, she signs a contract with a payday loan company. Uh, that gives her cash in the same day, let's say like $300 in the same day, and she agrees to pay back that amount in a certain period of time uh, with a certain percentage, uh, percentage of interest attached. So when she pays them back, she ends up paying significantly more because of the industry standard high interest rates, um, which can be around 400% APR sometimes. So payday loans are convenient for her in the short term uh, for emergency needs, but bad for long term because she becomes stuck in a cycle of debt. So Catherine hears about a new way to save and borrow money um, for emergency funds that's more fair, trustworthy, and lower cost. So rather than signing a contract with a third party, that's a faceless large entity that charges a lot of interest, uh, she signs a smart contract on WeTrust's platform with nine of her colleagues. Uh, in this smart contract, each person in her group agrees that they can borrow or lend money to each other at fixed intervals, and each one contributes and withdraws from this shared fund according to terms of their contract. So with WeTrust, um, Catherine's able to borrow money when she needs it at a significantly lower cost uh, than payday loans. So the smart contract enables this agreement um, to occur automatically and keeps your information safe. And all this is possible because of Ethereum. So what is Ethereum? So let's go back to 2,000 years ago and try to buy a chicken. Uh, this transaction is tangible. It occurs in the same place. It's physical and synchronous. Uh, the point of sale is very clear uh, and safe. So no private information is needed to be exchanged, like, uh, like who you are or where you live or what your interests are in order for you to buy this chicken. So let's try to buy chicken today. Uh, in order to get something online, you have to prove that you can pay for it, meaning uh, that you have to hand over electronic money and personal details about yourself. Uh, this transaction is attached to your credit card with your email, your phone number, and address, and all those fun details, uh, which can be sent and saved by companies outside of your transaction uh, with or without your approval. Um, you don't really have a choice sometimes. So while this seems convenient upfront, it comes at a hidden cost, and it costs to your privacy, your ownership, and your security. Uh, so if any one of these places is hacked, someone can steal your ent entire um, identity. So let's compare it to what Ethereum does. So let's say Catherine finally becomes a dentist and is making lots of money and she wants to buy a fancy chicken with her Ether, uh, which is the name of Ethereum's currency. So Catherine can send Ether directly to a provider and get this chicken in exchange. Uh, in this situation, there's no inter intermediary uh, taking a cut and she can trust that her information is encrypted, safe, and immutable. Um, it won't be hacked and her data belongs to her. So just to further explain with a little more granularity, um, the internet was designed to be decentralized, but the way that we use it has become increasingly centralized because of our reliance on third parties to the point where censorship and data sharing are accepted and hacks are kind of expected. So uh, we can't do a lot of transactions without these third parties. So philosophically, Ethereum is the next step in re-decentralizing the internet. 
Um, it allows people to safely interact without having to worry about trusting each other or a third party um, because trust is inherent in its technology. Um, so that means that users and providers can connect directly, allowing for rich interactions and relationships to take place online on these the decentralized apps. Um, and it also means that not one entity will no longer have control of your content. Your information is uh, yours. So just an FYI for advanced blockchain designers, um, this information that's shared in these transactions is pseudo-anonymous, uh, meaning that someone could see that a chicken was bought, but not much more than that. Um, so. What are Ethereum dApps? So here's where we'll get a little bit more technical into how a dApp works, um, but it's important for you to understand in order to design for it. So a dApp is a decentralized app. It's pronounced dApp, like Johnny Dapp. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this next statement is for advanced, like more advanced blockchain designers. So dApps don't always have to run on top of a blockchain network. Um, for example, uh, Tor and BitTorrent, but for today we'll, we'll be referring for dApps um, on the blockchain. So let's compare the structure of a traditional app to an uh, Ethereum dApp. So a traditional app um, uses HTML, CSS, and JavaScript to render a page, and it grabs details from a database, right? Like, use, like, utilizing an API, and it uses a centralized database to transfer that value. Um, so for example, let's say you want to pay your rent to your roommate. So you open your Venmo app, you send money to your roommate, Venmo sends data to their database, and then sends the money to your roommate. So while this seems very easy to do up front, um, there's a lot of inherent risk involved. So if anyone hacks into this database, you and your roommate's information will be exposed. It's a little cut off there, but okay. So, um, so let's, we can compare that to an Ethereum dApp. So you can think of Ethereum as the platform to create decentralized apps. It's like a decentralized app store. Um, it uses the same front end tech as a traditional app to render a page. But instead of an API connecting to a database, you have a smart contract connecting to a blockchain. Um, and this, is, this connects users and providers without the use of a centralized third party. Uh, so in the same situation, you're paying rent to your roommate. Um, you send Ether uh, through your online Ethereum wallet, which is encrypted. And the money is sent through Ethereum's virtual machine, which is, sounds like a big word, but it's, it's where the transaction is processed through uh, a distributed network of computers um, and gets verified on the blockchain. Um, and this is how Ethereum has such a good security system. Uh, your roommate receives the money within minutes and uh, your information is safe and is not sold to anyone in the process. So how do we design for this technology? So the good news is that the product design process is the same. Uh, but the fundamental thing you want to communicate in your designs is trust. It is more crucial than ever to gain trust with our uh, users, considering that they are using a new and unfamiliar technology. So what is trust? It's uh, transparency, it's comfort in trusting someone else, or um, you can rely on someone else, it's confidence. Um, can anyone tell me what trust is? Shout out. Anybody here? What is trust? <laughs> anyone? Guarantee? Feeling safe. Feeling safe. Yeah, it's tr trust is keeping your word. So the core of Ethereum dApps is about trust. And as designers, we need to communicate that in a visual and digestible way. Cool. So with the product design process, we begin with our discovery and analysis phase where we work, and where we work to understand the problem, um, who the users are, and dissect all the information thoroughly so we can start brainstorming for the rest of um, the flow, and then we, we move on to actually designing and testing and building it. So I'm gonna walk you through some of the steps I went through um, before arriving at um, my final designs. So in, in the discovery stage, I interviewed stakeholders, and I did um, a heuristic evaluation of uh, we trust DAP um, in this state. I took a deep dive into the problems and created experience goals and a persona based off of that research. In the analysis stage, I created uh, storyboards, um, use cases, and a user flow. And then in the design stage, I did sketches and wireframing and created comps and a prototype and did guerrilla user testing, all the whole thing. Uh, so through this work, um, one guiding principle that stood out was trust. And um, I'm gonna show you ways to gain trust with users when designing for a DAP. So first tip is to create trust is by being friendly. Yay. 
<laughs> it's so cute. Yeah. Okay, froze. All right. So when you first go into the <laughs> so when you first go into the We Trust app, um, you're guided to creating a lightning circle where you invite your friends or family to participate. So this is the original onboarding for creating this lightning circle. Um, it's a one-page form, kind of feels a little impersonal, like an accounting sheet. Not very fun. Uh, but when I redesigned it, I used trust elements to make it friendlier. I address the user by name to make it feel more personal. And I, uh, broke it I broke down the form into questions to make it feel like uh, more of a two-way conversation. The next tip is constant feedback. So time is a significant element in the blockchain, and it takes time to process a transaction um, and confirm it, which can be slower than what we're used to. So before, uh, users were unaware of when a transaction would be finished processing, and they had to keep um, checking in to, to check back on it. But we sh what we should do is let the user know that their transaction is in the works and try to set expectations of a wait time um, if possible and keep them in the loop asynchronously. So that's a notification that, um, of a change, um, like w w whether someone has contributed or a any a recent activity, we can notify them by text or email some way. Uh, the next tip is to guide user away from errors. So not all transactions can be reversed on the, the blockchain. So before someone could accidentally uh, create a lightning circle just by pressing this one button, um, but instead we should progress to a stage um, where we can allow users to review their actions and give additional friction to prevent them from making a mistake. Uh, so the next tip is to show the finish line. Um, here's our form again, our dry and endless form. Uh, to solve for this, I used a clear and persistent navigation in the design to actively guide the user towards finishing the task. Another tip is to avoid jargon. So blockchain concepts and terms that are specific to the app might have commonly understood meetings for technical advanced users, but not for the average user. <laughs> so using abstract words like uh, deploying to the blockchain or ROSCA or four person, weird, because they're uh, might confuse users because they're unfamiliar terms. So what I did was abstract the meaning from these complicated terms and simplified them. Uh, for example, deploying means to make effective on the blockchain or to go live. Um, and to make that state of the contract more clear on the homepage, I rearranged the IA to clarify like, which lending circles were active or inactive or pending instead of saying which ones are deployed or not. Uh, in the next example, I used the word Rasca instead of circle. Um, or I, I used the word circle instead of Rasca or a lending circle. Um, so Rasca means Rotated Savings and Credit Association. It's a big word. It's, it's the reason why I didn't mention it earlier when it's explaining what, what uh, WeTrust is. So this is a way to simplify that. Uh, next, I replaced the word four person with organizer. So an organizer is a four person. An organizer or four person is a human that's responsible for um, creating and managing this lending circle. Uh, and I placed a tool tip to clarify what an organizer is uh, to guide the user through the experience. So the next tip is to use visuals to explain the process. Here's our lovely form one more time. <laughs> this is supposed to be used to create, you know, again, your trusted lending circle with your friends and family. <laughs> In the redesign, I focus on the people aspect of a lending circle. Uh, so instead of creating a list of people um, to include in your lending circle, like as in the previous design, I use a fun game-like approach uh, where you actually create the circle, which usually ties into the product's value prop. So this is consistently used in the, in the design even once you start interacting with your lending circle. So as designers, we, need to, we know that people care a lot about privacy and security, which Ethereum has built in their technology. But first, we need to think about how to make it easy to get users set up for success. So there are considerable blockers for the average person if they decide to use ADAPT. Uh, but I think this is an opportunity for you as designers to create solutions around this. Uh, this is different for, uh, so for example, like when we use apps like Facebook Messenger or Instagram, we don't think about how the internet protocol works or APIs or databases because all of that's tucked away behind the UI. Uh, but this is different for adapt. So 
this is the on-ramp currently for users to interact with the centralized apps. So users need to know where to, where to buy crypto, which one to buy, how gas fees work, how to transfer or manage their crypto using public and private keys, how to download an Ethereum wallet or a MetaMask or whatever, um, and the time it takes for a transaction to post on the blockchain. So this might be more familiar for more advanced users, but as more and more non-technical non people are entering the space, we should be thinking about these things to uh, abstract that process and maximize usability for the end user. So Ethereum's opening up doors for the everyday person um, with this technology, and this is a huge opportunity for designers to bridge the UX gap for everyone. If you want to learn more about Ethereum, uh, check out these sites, the official Ethereum website, um, ethnews.com is pretty good, and BlockGeeks. Thank you.